Hello everyone and welcome to the classroom. Thank you for joining us as always. Today we'll be traveling to Rush Valley. That's it. Yes. And remembering one of the best but also most forgotten parts of Full Metal Alchemist. Full Metal Alchemist, the manga and both anime adaptations, is simply one of the most beloved shonen franchises of all time. A forthright story about the power of humanity, and now, hold on to your butt cheeks, because this one is pretty crazy, but even the power of friendship. But even a mangaka with as clear a focus as Hamoru Arakawa, the absolute goaded cow of the manga industry, Full Metal Alchemist still has one or two parts of the story that, when the incredible finale comes around, feel a little lost. I made my longest and most pretty alrightly written video on the finale of Full Metal Alchemist a few weeks ago. While I was making that and rereading parts of the series for that video, I got the idea to expand on the brief bits that I talked about Rush Valley, the manga, and earlier parts of the story. I was going to wait a little longer to put this one out, but you guys really liked the Full Metal Finale video, and like any educator can attest to, I am terrified of my classroom, so let's go. Rush Valley! Auto mail! Auto mail! Auto mail! Full Metal Alchemist, more than most, is really a story about its setting. The nation of Amestris has beautiful rolling fields, vast deserts, and is in the shape of a circle for absolutely no reason. Maybe even a good reason. Why not? However, the evil of this nation is both literally and metaphorically just under our character's feet. Blood soaks the soil in Amestris from brief skirmishes in the north with the neighboring Drachma, full conflicts in the south with the nation of Arugo, and even the outright genocide of the Ishvalan people in the Annex territories. I really do think that the setting of Full Metal Alchemist is one of the best in all of shonen storytelling. While it may not have the pure imagination or joy of something like Soul Eater or One Piece, what it does do is make you really feel like you live in and understand this world in a way that I think is really only rivaled now by Attack on Titan. We spend most of Full Metal Alchemist somewhere between our starting town of Resembool and the final boss area of Central in the finale. But within the 64 episodes or 18 volumes of Full Metal Alchemist, you travel from snowy peaks to bustling hubs of industry. So pick your poison. You know, if poison was awesome and made your life a thousand times better. Thank you, McCormick's brand vodka. Mother's Basement actually has a really funny video travel guide to the land of Amestris that I always have to rewatch before I travel back, you know, for safety's sake. Toward the edge of eastern Amestris, for example, we find the pious township of Lior, a strange place where, in contrast to the rest of this perfect 2D disc we call home, everyone's world seems to revolve around the sun. How novel. At many points throughout Full Metal, our characters being miles and miles apart with little way to contact each other is imperative to the tension of the series. It's what makes something I'm about to talk about all the more painful due to how long our main characters just don't know it even happened. Only 10 episodes into the series, we hit a moment that changes the tone, direction, and general amount of happiness in the series forever. You look surprised. What the hell are you? The death of Maze Hughes introduces a new, more grim tone to the series, on one section of the map anyways. Ed and Al have decided to reconnect with their old teacher in hopes of a training arc, a classic trope in shonen media. Winry has decided to go with to the home of Automail and Mecca of Automail Mechanics for a shopping arc, a classic trope in shoujo media. While Ed and Al go from Rush Valley to Dublith, Maze Hughes goes up to heaven, and you're going to subscribe. Rush Valley is a really fun part of the story, with a lot of standout moments that stick with me for a while, just not for the whole series. One of the best things about Full Metal Alchemist that my last video on the series was basically all about is how expertly tied together it all is 
and how that especially comes through in the finale. And while there are characters and story beats that are introduced in Rush Valley that end up being vital, it doesn't really feel like they're from Rush Valley, because, you know, they're not. What the hell are you doing here? Eating a delicious dinner? <laughs> while the characters who are actually from Rush Valley, the Russians will call them, end up feeling unimportant by the end of the series. Which is a real shame, because this has some of the most unique chapters in all of Full Metal Alchemist. This section of the story, once again, starts with the death of Maze Hughes, the first moment where the noose really tightens around our characters. Obviously, this isn't the first overtly dark moment in the series. I have a pen. I have an apple. Uh, apple pen. But it's the first time where our characters face real consequences for looking too far under their feet for trying to see what's really going on in Amestris. While Ed, Al, and Winry get to experience how incredible the setting of Full Metal is through cozy train rides, rolling hills, and apple pie, the story ratchets up another gear in Central. Roy assembling his Central City inner circle is awesome, as he and Riza have made a pact to each other to go after military high command, but they will need allies. Master Sergeant Kane Fury, Warrant Officer Vato Fallman, Second Lieutenant Hyman's Breda, and of course, Man Slut Jean Havoc. Quit staring. It's not very polite. Well, I can see how she tricked you so easily. You've always been a sucker for big boobs. <laughs> I can't help it! I love them! While on the one hand, this section of the story may darken the series forever, it's also very important to give us these moments of hope where our characters gain allies, not lose them. Meeting Izumi Curtis and Mr. Izumi Curtis in Dublith is already a great reveal for what and who got Ed and Al to where they are today, but the mystery is further tightened, the tension is ratcheted up again when under the streets of Dublith, we not only meet the first greed, but learn that the leader of the nation of Amestris, Fuhrer King Bradley, is the homunculus known as Wrath. Can I just use a joke from my last Full Metal video? Is that allowed? Fuck, this Fuhrer King guy is bad news. Meeting Izumi Curtis is fantastic, and even though I do know and believe that the manga is the ideal way to enjoy Full Metal Alchemist, I am happy that they decided to cut most of the Lord of the Flies flashback. It's one of the only things from the manga that I'm happy didn't make it into the anime. While Izumi may have an awesome return in the finale and is essential for the final act in multiple ways, her introduction in Dublith pales in comparison to the royalty we meet when we're back in Rush Valley. The introduction of Ling Yao and his Xingyi's posse is one of the simplest and coolest world-building moments in the entire series. While up until this point we have learned about other countries and even met peoples besides the Amestrians in Ishval, for example, the series has been very Amestrian. But Ling, Lan Fan, and Old Man Fu give us a glimpse into the world outside Amestris. There are discussions about philosophy, social customs, and the differences between Amestris's alchemy and Jing's alkahestry. And after some incredible action with engaging foes and a new bar for protagonists to clear, whether you're watching or reading, we are clued into just how dangerous this country may be, as Ling knows that there is something deeply wrong with the alchemy here. And luckily, since Amestris is kinda... evil, we have even more help from outside the perfectly circular borders. Look what I found, Ed. <laughs> We're a little busy right now to be adopting panda bears out! Mei Chang, the young alkahestry expert trying to steal the secret to immortality and return it back to her family in Xing. In the manga, she's introduced in the mining town of Yuzwell, having just come across the desert from Xing, she passes out and is given free food. So is that just something you do if you're from Xing, or...? In the anime, however, the mining town of Yuzwell... <coughs> ...doesn't exist, Ooh. 
The beginning of Full Metal Alchemist is one of the most well-worn parts of the story. Between Brotherhood, the 2003 series, the manga, flashbacks and spin-offs, movies and video games, the Elric's first fight against Father Cornello and their grave mistake have been shown time and time again. Since the beginning of Brotherhood is already retreading ground in a lot of ways, except for a filler pilot, a truly psychotic gambit that somehow kinda works. The creators wanted to get to the new, sexy, plot-driven stuff as quickly as they possibly could while still covering what they absolutely had to from the first part of the series. Because of this, technically unimportant parts of the story, like a gripping train fight, are cut. You know, I've heard a rumor out at the bars where people are always talking about shonen manga adaptations. That you can watch the 2003 Fullmetal Alchemist with such wonders as the train fight. However, I couldn't find it on Crunchyroll or Netflix or anything like that that I pay for. So, like, I guess it's, like, impossible to watch ever? Pirate, pirate, pirate. In the manga, we also find the mining town of Usewell, where we not only learn about the three tenants for state alchemists, obey the military, gladly, do not create gold, not as gladly, and do not create life. Well, that one seems good at least. Usewell introduces us to a greedy military official, but even more than that, it shows us that Ed and Al Elric can outsmart any opponent. Unfortunately, as evil often does, he escaped into the night and now lives outside of punishment for his crimes, never to be seen again. His name is Yoki, though, and he looks like this, so if you see something, say something. Come on and party tonight! Getting rid of where Yoki is introduced is one thing, because, you know, he's like in the finale, but he does one small thing, so... Whatever, honestly. Mei Chang, however, is also introduced in Yu's Well, just later, and is slightly more important. You know, just a little. But luckily, even though their introductions get a little messed up from the mining town of Yu's Well being wiped off the map, they get to the finale just fine. Yup, everyone is here. Everyone important that we ever met in the series who can fight are all in Central at the end to help in their own way. Yup. Everyone is here. We've got Ed, Al, Hohenheim, Roy Mustang, Riza Hawkeye, the Armstrongs, everyone from Shing. Well, not everyone from Shing, that's a lot of people. But we've got everyone. We took care of everything, believe me, we did. Did I turn off the coffee? No. I did. Did you lock up? Yeah. Did you close the garage? That's it. I forgot to close the garage, that's it. No, that's not it. What else can we be forgetting? Kevin! Did I do this on purpose? Well, I'll answer your question with a question. Is Roy Mustang wearing a Celine lingerie bodysuit priced at $2,200 under his uniform at all times? I guess we'll never know. While I already talked about the lead-up and journey to Rush Valley with the murder of Maze Hughes and then the return to Rush Valley, where we get introduced to Shing as like a real thing with people and not just a distant idea like the Lost Nation of Xerxes. I skipped over talking about a whole section of the story that I actually really enjoy because, well, it's just kinda easy to do, honestly. When Ed, Al, and Winry arrive in Rush Valley, we're treated to not just hilarious character moments across both adaptations, but in the manga, Arakawa gets to stretch her artistic skills as well, giving us not just incredibly novel desert scapes and canyons, but some of the most detailed automail in the whole series. Rush Valley is a hub of life, mechanical and otherwise, with some of the most skilled automail artisans in the nation. Fullmetal Alchemist is a wonderfully written story with an endless amount of themes and motifs to mine, but one of my favorite is the pure joy of life. The only way to win in the world of Fullmetal Alchemist is to embrace all of the life in the world, all of the humanity there is. That's what makes Hohenheim's relationship with the souls inside of himself so important. 
It's what Greed, one of the best characters in these series, gives his life in sake of. This love for life is expressed in one of the most heartfelt and just plain awesome moments in Fullmetal Alchemist, just outside of Rush Valley. The baby! As we've heard from first Winry and now myself several times, Rush Valley is basically the Silicon Valley of Automail. So it would be really disappointing if we didn't get to see at least one crazy new type of Automail, or at the very least a social network level business drama. You better lawyer up, asshole, because I'm not coming back for 30%. I'm coming back for everything. With Paninia, an orphan thief who pickpockets through the dense streets of Rush Valley, we get to see the coolest automail until we get to Briggs. Her knee cannon, or the patella pistol as I call it, and the blades in her leg make for a really engaging action scene. And this marks as one of the last times we'll see Al have to transmute with his stupid nerd chalk. Winry, like Ed and Al, wants to get better. While hard work may not be as present a theme in Full Metal as in other action anime, at this point in the series, with Ed and Al returning to Teacher, it absolutely is. Winry wants to become the best automail mechanic she can be, already a prodigy from reading her parents' medical books while they served in their own way in Ishval. Winry now needs a teacher too, especially if Ed is gonna keep fucking up her automail. Ed, did you see what you've done to my beautiful creation? I slaved over this! It's basically the same, it's just in smaller pieces. This is where we meet Dominic, the best automail engineer in Rush Valley, so also maybe the world? But anyways, we will now be getting to... The baby! Dominic lives in the mountains outside of Rush Valley, where the ore is pure and the people are... not there? Quickly after they arrive at Dominic's, Winry gets rejected from her new internship with him several times, and then she tries something unconventional. She's going to deliver a baby in the office. Could work. Dominic's daughter-in-law is giving birth, and a storm has made it impossible to get to town or get a doctor to their home. Arakawa, through a few heart-wrenching scenes of helplessness, perfectly sets up that the only person here who can get this done is Winry motherfucking Rockbell. Winry is one of the most important characters in all of Fullmetal Alchemist. Not only is she the reason Ed has a leg to stand on at all, but she just feels like home. Rezimbul, Granny Pinako, and Winry aren't just important parts of the series. This love waiting at home for Ed and Al is the whole heart of it. Hey! I forgot! Grandma wanted me to tell you she's making stew tonight! Fuck yeah! And this stands as my favorite moment from the heart of that heart, Winry Rockbell. Her gaining the strength to get the job done is only rivaled by her being overcome with emotion seeing Ed and Al with their bodies back. In an action series like Full Metal, obviously I remember the big fights. Greed vs. Wrath, Scar vs. Wrath, Greed vs. Wrath again, Mustang vs. Envy, if, if you can call that one a fight. <laughs> but Arakawa is so good at giving us these character moments like the Ed and Usewell that we never got to see, where fighting has nothing to do with it. We see such a brief moment of uncertainty from Winry, especially for a character who is usually so confident. Winry quietly panics to herself until, in another moment of faith and support that this series does so well, Ed gives her his trust. This is one of the most unique story beats in Fullmetal Alchemist, one of the last big moments in the series that truly has nothing to do with Father, the Homunculi, or the Promise Day. We see Dominic's rough exterior soften up just a bit when he meets his grandson, and he even sets Winry up for a job with just the most heterosexual man I've ever seen. Rush Valley is a really fun section of the story, not just in Winry delivering the baby, but meeting one half of one of my favorite characters in the series is obviously great. I'm just a little disappointed that this great part of the story wasn't tied in as thoroughly to the finale as other elements of the show. The return of characters like Lon Fawn, Izumi Curtis, and Jean Havoc is so fantastic that I'm just a little bummed we couldn't see Panini get in on the action too. Obviously she's not in the military, but neither 
Naomi, maybe she could have come back with like a rail gun built into her knee. And the baby can come too. Let's go. Full Metal Alchemist, simply one of the greatest shonen stories ever told. And this changes nothing. I also still love Rush Valley, I just wish that by the finale it felt a little more substantial like the rest of the story does. But that is the video for this week, y'all. I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Hey, everyone. I really hope you liked that video. If you made it to this point, thank you as always. And if you made it to this point, a special double thank you as always. Thank you so much. I have something very cool to show off for my collection this week, but not Full Metal Alchemist related. But first, let's talk about that a little. I... I really hope you guys liked this video. This was a tough one to write because, truth be told, the idea to have me, like, forget about the birth didn't come until, like, later in it. And that whole time, I was really stressed about how I hadn't mentioned it yet and how the fuck the, like, timeline of this video was gonna work. But I hope you guys liked it. But anyways, I have this, uh, book of... I have to, like, put, like... I have to put it... There we go. Uh, I have this book of Alex Ross Marvel Villains posters. I've always been more of a DC guy, as I've mentioned many times on this channel. But one thing that I do love in Marvel is they've got a lot of really good villains. A lot of green ones. Uh, I realized a lot of green Spider-Man villains. I mean, red and blue is contrasted by green, so that makes sense for that. But, like, even, like, Annihilus is green... I'm just, like, looking around here because I've got some up in here. Baron Mordo, he's green. The Goblin. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I've got some here in my office. You can't see any of them right now. The only issue is I want to put them all, like, places that, like, make sense, you know? So, like, I've got, like, over by my desk, uh, I have, like, Kingpin and Magneto and some other, like, big, like, boss men of Marvel that will remind me to, you know, be dope and stack my paper. Uh, <laughs> but... The issue is that Red Skull is still in here. And I don't know uh, where I... I don't know where I want to put a Nazi in my home. I don't think anywhere, to be quite honest. Uh, yeah, the closest I can think is, like, I put Scorpion down by the trash because Scorpion has a trash life. But, like, that's too good for a Nazi, a trash life. Like, we all agree on that, right? Okay, well, uh, I'll see you all next time. I hope you liked the video. Goodbye.